Hello and welcome in the series of the Institute of Health Studies Research Seminar. Um, this month I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Christine Webb who is a Professor of Health Studies and works with us here at the Institute. Christine will be discussing the evaluation of the use of portfolios in the assessment of learning and competence in nursing, midwifery and health visiting. I feel this will be of great value as it will help to identify how we can further contribute towards a student's investment in their portfolio development. This will also help us to judge the merit of their collection of evidence and the contribution this makes towards their practice development. Also joining us today is Faye Doris, Head of Department Maternal Child Health and Podiatry and Ruth Clemo, Senior Lecturer in Adult Nursing. They will assist us in further inquiry of Christine's presentation while we wait for a telephone call. The telephone number is 01752 233646 or you can email the studio on tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk. Today's programme will follow its usual format. I'll shortly hand over to Christine and following her presentation we will be keen to receive your calls. This should be about between 12.30 and 1 o'clock. Can I remind you at this point that you do need to utilise the mute button on your handset as you speak. This will avoid the feedback noise sometimes experienced. Do call. We do value your participation. Now, without further delay, I'm going to hand over to Christine. Do enjoy evaluation of the use of portfolios in the assessment of learning competence in nursing, midwifery and health visiting. Thank you, Annie. Um, I first of all need to apologise if I'm going to be uh, peering a lot. I have a problem with my glasses and the light and everything, so take no notice of the funny uh, facial gestures that you might see. Um, I'm going to first of all flash through some of the issues in the literature and then say very briefly about the uh, methods that we used in the study because I know what people are mostly interested in these occasions is the findings. So we found discussions in the literature about the authenticity of what people were writing in their portfolios and how this was verified. In other words, was what they were writing a valid reflection of the experience they were having in their practice and was the assessment reliable you know if if they had been assessed on the same evidence by different assessors would they have uh, had the same assessment outcome and how useful in assessment was critical reflectiveness development and how did that link up with practice and what was the role of academic staff in facilitation and guidance towards preparation of the portfolio and another issue, which I'm sure people have also come across in the literature, is is there a conflict between the summative assessment function and the learning value? No, does the assessment really become the tail that wags the dog and detract from the actual learning that might otherwise potentially take place? So first of all, uh, before I go on to how students actually use the portfolios, just very uh, two or three sentences about the design. It was a two-year EMB funded study um, that was conducted across four universities, the lead one being Plymouth. And first of all, um, Kim Pankhurst joined us and did a national telephone survey. The purpose of that was meant to be to identify models of portfolio that we would then pursue in subsequent stages in four case studies. But what we found was really there was no perceptible patterns across the board. No people in different in one institution could be using different models of portfolio in their different programs. So we chose our four case studies on the basis of variation, really maximum variation. Although, as I'll come to in a minute, we did identify some models as we went along. So the second stage was to go into the university side of those four case studies and do interviews with the teaching staff. Um, we did observation in classrooms. We did some um, focus groups with students. We looked at the curriculum documents, the QA, evaluations, external examiners' reports, etc. 
And then the third stage was intended to be observation in the clinical areas to see how the portfolios were being used. But in practice, it turned out not to be feasible. And the third stage really became interviews in the clinical uh, setting with students and their assessors. So mostly paired interviews. Right. We concluded that what was happening when students were using the portfolios was that they were having to deconstruct the learning outcomes. Now, they had to look at the learning outcomes that were set out in the portfolios and ask themselves, what do they mean? And they found that there was a lot of overlap and repetition between these outcomes. Many of the um, portfolios were using as outcomes the statements of the 89 um, Nurses Act or the UKCC generic outcomes and students and assessors found those written at such a globally abstract level that they really couldn't tell what they meant. And so what they had to do was kind of unpick them and, and see how does this really link with our practice and then kind of reconstruct what they were doing in practice to write it in their portfolios to give what they thought that the teachers expected. So I'll give you um, a few quotes um, that the, are the evidence for that assertion. We asked the students, which part of your portfolio really tells the person who looks at it about your competence? And so a Project 2000 student said, it's the generic statements. Another one said, I'm not sure. Some of the statements are more relevant than others. The skills log is more relevant. Another one said, I really don't know. I struggle with the portfolio because I've been out of school for 23 years. I have the problem that in every placement I go to, I have the problem of identifying what I've done with what they say in the portfolio. So that last one is really a very good summary of what I'm saying about deconstruction and reconstruction. And when we put the same question to an assessor, on a pre-reg program, she said, I don't think you can identify one particular section. The pathway specific tasks, and it's interesting she uses the word tasks, is vital. That, that was really um, the, what the students called the skills log. All nurses need specific skills, she went on, especially to start off with and to build upon. Also, the competency that she meant there, the generic outcomes, reflects a deeper understanding. Right. So, when you look at the literature, what is identified as crucial to evidence in portfolios is not just documenting what's been done, but actually using that material. In other words, reflecting on it and turning that evidence into something new. So rather than just rewriting history and having this artificial element, were students actually transforming the material that they were collecting? And this is where we were able to identify four models. And the first model and the least really theoretically appropriate to a portfolio was what we called the shopping trolley. And this was where the portfolio was like a shopping trolley. You, you just threw in everything that you happened to come across. So it might be um, a photocopy of an article, a certificate of attendance at a course, a thank you letter from a patient, any kind of thing was just bunged in and nothing was done to link them. The next most sophisticated but hardly more sophisticated it was mostly used on pre-reg programs and we called that the toast rack. It seemed that in each module the portfolio was like a toast rack and there were little slices of toast that you had to put in so you might have a skills log and a reflective statement and a piece of coursework whatever and then, so as you went through the course, you assembled all your toast racks, one for each module, until you came to the end. But there was nothing done to integrate and link the slices of toast into an overall learning experience from that module. The spinal column, 
I'm not sure that I ever totally understood this, I have to say. This was more relevant to post-registration programs, where each competency was represented by a vertebra. And the evidence that fed into it was the um, nerves that feed in. So it might be that one piece of evidence or nerve might actually supply evidence to more than one vertebra. So there was beginning to be a bit of integration there between the competencies and the evidence. The most sophisticated level was what we called the cake mix. So the ingredients were there, the butter, the sugar, the flour, or the various pieces of evidence, but they were actually cooked and transformed and this was um, via the reflective element that transformed those separate bits of evidence then into something new. The specialist practice programs tended to be more towards the bottom end of that list, whereas the pre-reg programs were more towards the top end. And what made the specialist pro practice programs different was that there was usually a one-to-one -one relationship with the assessor over sometimes the whole of the program or a relatively long period um, of perhaps six months or more so that then continuity was able to inform assessor judgments that the assessor and the student worked together a lot and so direct observation went on and many assessors use the phrase well I know the student I would just know if they're competent so um, I'll just read you one or two quotes um, to back that up. Uh, this is um, a post-registration assessor. I use it, that's the portfolio, from the beginning to get the student thinking about the competencies. She has a go at writing one, then we discuss it, she reworks it and so on, until I'm happy that she's demonstrating what I consider to be competence. And another one, in specialist practice said, I would know if a student was making it up because we would have discussed things and I'd have observed her. Even when she does visits alone, she comes back in and we go over the visit and ref explore it reflectively. So I would know. So those two quotes are obviously from a very effective um, relationship between the assessor and the student. However, with such a long placement and a close one-to-one -one relationship, if, if it isn't good, then that's also problematic, as this um, next example shows. We ask the student, how much guidance is given by your assessor? And the student says, none, absolutely none. I haven't discussed it with her at all. Personally, I don't think she rates them. I think she puts more emphasis on us talking about things. And we will um, pick up this point about preparation of um, assessors for the use of portfolios a bit later on. So in contrast with that on the pre-registration programs, the students had multiple placements of a relatively short duration and the nature of practice on the wards was completely different from in specialist areas and it was much more likely, it seemed, that practice was uh, like it was when I was a student, that Although the students were supernumerary, when they went on a shift with their assessor, the assessor would say, well, you go off and take this lady to the bathroom or whatever. And when the student had done that, they would report back to the assessor, who would have in the meantime got on with their work. Then the student would be given something else to do. So this working very closely together and direct observation didn't seem to be happening to anything like the same extent on the pre-registration programmes. However, Faye hasn't bribed me to say this next bit, midwifery did seem to be a bit of an exception. The teachers had strong relationships with the clinical staff. I went uh, more than once with a midwifery lecturer um, into the clinical area for various reasons. And she would walk in and meet a midwife and say, oh, how was Mrs. So-and-so? Do you remember that lady last week who had a certain problem? And they would have a discussion. And you know, th there was that uh, close knowledge. And the midwifery students would work in a one-to-one -one supervision situation with their midwife most of the time. And if their midwife wasn't there, they would have a second midwife who did that. So the motivation level of the midwifery students was phenomenally high. And 
the quotations I'll give in a minute about how they describe their experiences are quite different from anything that we got from students on the other branches. Uh, so, for example, a student said, Everybody I've worked with has been wonderful. The midwives are a good advert for it. Another one said, I'm doing what I've always wanted to do and it's fantastic. And uh, just a third one, I'm very happy. There's so much to take in and I was thinking that I'm never going to take it all in. But it's all come together in the last few weeks. So one of the things that we wondered about this was, was it to do with the midwifery um, usually being very small cohorts, eight, nine or ten students in the places where we studied. But we concluded that that wasn't the issue because often the child branch, mental health and learning disabilities were also small cohorts with similar numbers and we didn't find the repetition of that commitment of staff to the clinical areas and the motivation and so we didn't find that in those smaller branches. What were some of the issues that were brought up about the portfolios? And I'm sure these will be very familiar to us. The size and the bulk of portfolios, the complexity of their structure, the difficulty students had of finding their way around them, particularly at the beginning, the time needed for their completion, so that it came to the point when the, there was so much focus on the portfolio, as I hinted earlier, the tail was wagging the dog. We came to ask, was the portfolio assessing the process or the outcome? Was it a record of what the student actually did or an assessment in any way of how they did it? There seemed to be at least the possibility of faking it. I'm sure everybody knows what I mean by that. <laughs> and the critical element was also not strong. I'll just... Um, read out some quotations from that and perhaps it, we might go into some of those bits particularly the more critical bit in the discussion at the end. This is a year three project 2000 student. It takes ages. First you do them in rough, show your assessor and then in, in neat. It takes a few hours not including the research going to the library etc. Another one, uh, another project 2000 year three student it takes ages to do it properly, on average about 10 hours for each one. And again, I do it in rough, I do it in neat, I show it to my personal tutor, not the assessor, as she has got enough work to do. A specialist practice assessor said, sometimes I feel as though we're swimming in a sea of mud. It's the sheer wordage of the documents, reading the same thing over and over again, the sheer volume of words. I don't doubt that the education side know what they're doing, <laughs> but the same thing is being said in a lot of places. I sat in on a preparation session in the first week of a pre-reg programme where a teacher was preparing the students to use the portfolios and even at that early stage in the language that she was using, she was setting the tone for this rather negative um, viewpoint of the portfolios. For example, she use the sentence, you don't have to lug the whole thing around with you all the time. And, you know, that really seems to set a tone quite early on. So what we found was that the clinical assessors knew in their heart, or wherever you know these things, what they meant by competence. And they assessed the students on that, and they wrote in the portfolio as a separate exercise, if you like. So this is another example of this deconstructing and then reconstructing to make the portfolio look like they thought it was expected to look. So that the portfolio provided supporting evidence. And what people said was practice assessment tools need to be developed in collaboration between teachers and assessors. And I'm sure that here and in the other centres where we did the study, teachers felt that they did that, but somehow it wasn't effective. And when the portfolios came to be used by assessors, there were all these kinds of problems that I've been speaking about. <laughs> 
And one of them was the structure of the portfolios. And an issue that came up was about reflection. And often students were taught in the university to use a particular model of reflection, but sometimes it was just too complex for them, particularly in the early stages of the programme. And there was a tendency not to use the, portfolio, the model to structure their reflections, but for them just to be descriptive and to focus very much on feelings at the expense or complete absence of actual uh, clinical uh, critical analysis and students weren't sure whether they were meant to bring references into these reflections or not. Uh, so another point that we might pick up later is whether theory and practice are brought together in the portfolio or not. And unless a further and better preparation is done in this way, what seems to happen is it's the writing skills of the students that determine the quality of what is written rather than their skills in actual reflection and the depth of their learning. Another issue is whether the portfolio is able to discriminate between students. There were monitoring processes in place, there was double marking and there were internal moderation, although the effectiveness of these is questionable really. And Often it seemed that rather than it being a systematic process, um, as described in curriculum documents, that a, stu a tutor would collect in her students' portfolios and, and look through them and check that they were complete and sign them off. And only if uh, there was a doubt would they be shown to another tutor, perhaps someone who shared the office or... Um, someone else working on that branch to have a look at them. So that systematic internal moderation didn't really seem to be um, taking place as it uh, was intended. Teachers and assessors could identify weak students, but it wasn't always possible through the portfolio to make this evident. And failure or discontinuation on the basis of the portfolio was rare or non-existent. I mean, a, a particular quote that stands in my mind from, a, this was a learning disabilities um, branch leader, was, the really weak students still seem to get through. And we would be um, told by assessors that they would have problems with students that they would bring to a uh, teacher's attention and that it wouldn't be picked up so that they became kind of disillusioned with doing that and you know having been in the game a long time it struck me that the various different methods of clinical assessment that we've had over the years ward reports the four um, GNC assessments and so on haven't really dealt with all these problems they've, they've always been the same that it's hard to to discontinue students, that there's the criticism that the two sides, the education and service side, aren't closely enough in touch with them. And, and it is a worry because if, if we're saying that practice is what we value highly, but we never reject students on the basis of their practice assessment, only on the theory assessment, it seems to me that's a huge problem there. Uh, let me just find my quotes about that. Uh, this is about the double marking and the monitoring and so on. And this is uh, a researcher's field notes about a pre-registration programme. In reality, at this site, portfolios were marked by the student's academic mentor and then subject to internal moderation, which occurs across pathways and was perceived to be a valuable method of achieving consistency of marks. But in some places, assessors were identified as responsible for assessing the portfolio, and this was often then checked by the university lecturer before being sent to the external assessor. The issue of who assesses the portfolio was controversial for both students and uh, clinical workers. They felt that it should be the sole responsibility of the assessor to assess competence because they were the one working with the student and saw their progress and achievements. However, as one student said, this is a specialist practice student, we feel that we are working together to appease the lecturers and the external examiner. 
It undermines the assessor's role because it's not clear who's marking it. If we work together to interpret a competency as X, but the lecturer doesn't agree, or the external examiner throws it back, whose judgment is it that counts? Right. Question of um, giving feedback to students, then. Let me just see where I'm up to with my slides. Yeah. Most, both pre- and post-registration uh, programs had these tripartite meetings set up, which were meant to take place sometimes at the beginning or the middle of a placement, but certainly at the end. And it was intended that the student, the assessor, and usually the personal teacher would meet together and look at the portfolio and have a, a discussion. And this would be one opportunity where feedback would be given to students. And where this worked, it really seemed to be good. Here's a quote from another uh, pre-reg lecturer. The good tripartites really stand out. The enthusiasm and the way that students talk about how they've got to know the client, the rationale to develop the interventions, and how they've gone and found the literature, and how they sold it to other members of staff. You can see that they're really quite highly skilled. And you think, yes, they really are functioning on a high level and they're doing things properly, and they can clearly articulate why they do that. But in some places, for reasons given by education staff, such as long distances of traveling and their heavy um, classroom workload, tripartite meetings didn't take place at all, might be reduced to a telephone call between the lecturer and the uh, clinical assessor, it, sometimes, instead of it being the personal teacher, it was delegated to the link teacher. And then the student may have never met that link teacher before the meeting took place on, in the clinical area. And so it was a completely different um, depth, or rather lack of depth, to the tripartite meeting. Um, a competency curriculum student in the second year said, I haven't had any feedback when you get your portfolio back, everything is signed off and that. It would have been nice to get something back from the college. Uh, and that, a similar thing was very common to be said. And that if everything was okay with the portfolio, it would just be signed off and passed back to the student. And often time didn't permit anything else because the student needed it back because they were passing into another placement. And it would only be if there was some problem that the student would be called in by the teacher um, to have a discussion about that. So personal tutor feedback was rare unless it was a negative situation. Another issue that came up was about preparation for using the portfolio in relation to students. I've already said one or two things that hint that it, it wasn't as effective as it might have been. And in, in some ways, it created a negative impression before this, they started. A pre-registration lecturer said, we're into, students are introduced to portfolios at the beginning of the program. At the beginning of the practice module, we have a day where we look at what the module is about and how it's assessed. We look at the portfolio and we use problem-based learning workshops. There's also a half an hour of reflection at the end of the day where students can reflect on what they have done <clears throat> and what they might do. We discuss the types of evidence we're expecting and we explain the tripartite relationship. So the lecturing staff built this preparation in for students, but it often seemed that in the sort of separation of the classroom from the clinical setting, the students really weren't able to make sense of um, what was being said. And when they got out into the placement, there was this sea of mud experience that I mentioned earlier. But there was the, also the issue of teachers. A learning disabilities teacher on the Project 2000 programme said, I think that they, we didn't as a group of teachers have a clear idea of what we were to do in the reflective sessions. It was very much up to the teacher who was doing that. 
there were people involved in the curriculum that weren't actually committed to reflection and therefore saw it as a low priority. The students got fed up with that because it was unstructured and I think probably the groups were too big. There were groups of 20, whereas I think you need a much smaller group. The students then got disillusioned and fed up with it and the whole thing slipped. I think there was just a lack of commitment to it. And I did go to some of these uh, reflective sessions and I'm just going to read a little bit from one so that you can, uh, to illustrate that previous quote. This is in fact from a, um, a midwifery one where this was an example of something that didn't go so well in midwifery, so sorry about that, Faye. Uh, this was a, sh a session that was scheduled for two hours and there were only uh, six midwifery students. So the teacher went in and said, so how's it going? And the first student said, I've met one of my assessors, she's brilliant. So then the teacher says, have you met so-and-so who was a lecturer practitioner yet? Look at your learning outcomes. And student number two says, I haven't seen T yet and I didn't last term either. I've met with my assessor. So then the teacher turns to the third student. I've met with quite a few midwives, my mentor and three others in the team. The teacher says, you need to be working mainly with two for consistency. Turns to the next student who says, I've been out with three midwives and I've met a tutor. I only met T in the last week of last term. Turns to the next student. I'm loving it. My midwife's really nice. She goes through everything. I actually want to get up in the morning and go to work. Teacher turns to student six. I'm fine. I feel a bit like a spare part just stood there, but now I'm getting used to it. I've not met with a tutor. She's been off sick with a cold. This is how it goes on, like a round. And at the end of 40 minutes, nobody has anything else to say and it's wound up. So that what's happened is not reflection, but just a reporting back, more like a diary log of what happened and opportunities for reflection were lost, uh, not taken up. And then assessors also, there was a big problem with assessors being able to attend preparation sessions that were put on. In one um, centre they had prepared a distance learning pack for assessors who weren't able to attend sessions and they were uh, should work through those packs. But um, if people hadn't attended sessions or couldn't provide evidence that they'd worked through the pack, they still were used as assessors because of the resource issue that they wouldn't have enough assessors otherwise. What was the role of external examiners in this whole process? In most places the intention was that they would sample portfolios. Sometimes they would be mailed uh, a sample of portfolios in advance but it was more common that they would attend on the day of the exam board and the portfolios would be made available, either a selection or all of them, and the external examiner would make their own sample. But usually there was only an hour perhaps um, available for this to be done, and so it was a, a relatively superficial one uh, look, and it might be just the portfolios that uh, teachers had brought to attention as particularly problematic. A mental health lecturer who had been an external in another um, setting said, if I read this portfolio from another college, I couldn't say this person is competent. I could only say this person has done this and this and this. It sounds like they handle things okay. But if I really wanted to know how, I would have to be there. And that goes back to my earlier point about were the uh, portfolios assessing the process of what actually went on or the outcome. However, in some systems it was possible for the external examiner to participate in or even change decisions. This is a field note quote from an examination board. The external was satisfied with the number of portfolios she was sent over the time that she's been the external examiner, she's seen an improvement in the level of reflection and the student guidelines have evolved to become much more consistent. In this exam board, as a result of their portfolio, five students had their classification raised, two had theirs reduced. Of the five who had theirs raised, three were raised into first class honours. Right. <clears throat> 
one of the big issues in the literature is are portfolios valid and reliable methods of assessing competence? And most of the discussion focuses, as those two words, validity and reliability, would imply, on being able to quantify evidence of competence. And they're obviously derived from um, quantitative research concepts. But it seems to me that the kind of evidence we have in portfolios is much more like the kind of evidence we have in qualitative research. And so maybe it would be more useful if we started to think about rigor using those kinds of terminology. And in fact, in the, um, in the systems that we looked at, there were quite uh, definite evidence, evidences of an audit trail being there. You know, the student described what they did, the assessor verified it, the tripartite meeting further verified it, double marking, moderation, external examining processes, which were all documented, took you through that track. So if those processes were done effectively and as they were intended to be and as they were written in the curriculum documents, the audit trail would provide evidence for rigour However, as I've said, as we've been going through, they weren't always applied in that rigorous way. And so then, then you therefore couldn't say that the audit trail gave you that confidence. As we were um, part way through the project, the EMB came to an end and the Department of Health took over the uh, supervision of the project. And they aren't going to publish the full report or the highlights in the way that the EMB did. And it's up to us to um, get the results out in articles. We have had three articles accepted already and we've got some more in press. And the um, Department of Health were only interested in recommendations about policy. They weren't interested in recommendations about great details, really, of the um, portfolios. I can see that I'm coming to the end of my time, so I will think I'll um, pass up the last slides on those recommendations and perhaps we might take those up in the discussion uh, when people are phoning in or when we get back to the couch, which is where I'm now progressing to. Well, Christine, thank you very much for a very interesting um, presentation. Um, may I just remind you of the telephone number um, for you to raise questions. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen, um, Plymouth 233646. But also I'd just like to remind you of the um, email tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk. So we'll look forward to your questions in, in the next few minutes. Um, I'd first like to um, say thank you to Christine and then just hand over to Ruth. You had a question you wanted to ask please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christine, for that a very interesting presentation. I'm actually interested in your idea of the use of evaluation criteria, other than that of validity and reliability, in the evaluating of portfolios and as an assessment tool. And I was just recently uh, reading the um, learning and teaching support um, network recommendations, and they were obviously pointing um, towards something quite similar. I wondered if you could perhaps just expand on your recommendations in that respect. You did identify the audit trail, for example. Yes, there are various concepts, aren't there, in qualitative research that we, we could pick up on. For example, um, the idea of member checking, where you have more than one person looking at the data and seeing if they come to the same interpretation. And that, it, in fact, was happening in the tripartite meetings, where they were good ones and where they were effective. So, so that's another example of how it could be made to work, but perhaps it, it didn't. The idea of um, two independent researchers looking through the data and identifying themes and seeing if they agree, that is another feature of um, qualitative research. If internal moderation and double marking were done effectively, that would be a parallel process that would add to the credibility, which is another word that, that um, we use in qualitative mm -hmm. research. It um, turns out that in the general education literature on assessment and its rigour, 
these ideas have been in discussion al already, as, as you've hinted from the work that you've got there. So in a way, we uh, came up with them in independently, but because we weren't aware of that uh, wider literature at the time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've just got an, an email. Yeah. I'll read that, please. Um, and it's from Lynn Nichols from Taunton. Um, it seems that what makes a por portfolio work is the element of refre reflection that acts yes. as the catalyst. In other words, to he heat or cook all of the other yes. ingredients. And so she's saying some people struggle with the concept of reflection because it's not their natural learning style. Had you identified whether there's any other mechanism that became apparent that could also supply the actual heat for the cake mix, just so to speak. Um, perhaps the relationship with the assessor and tutor was also part of it. We did come up with things like that in our policy recommendations, and one of them was about these models of reflection that students are suggested to use in, in, the, in these reflective accounts. And our recommendation was that perhaps at the beginning of the programme, particularly for pre-registration students, they would be recommended to use a relatively simple method of reflection and to have quite structured headings, perhaps, that they, they wrote in, so that they would actually kind of be for forced, if you like, okay. to have a reflective element rather than just a description. This is, this is what happened. And then as they went through the course, perhaps they could be introduced to more complex methods of reflection so that they would gradually be sort of shaped into doing it. But I think the element of preparation of the teachers and of the assessors themselves to know what they were ex what was expected and how they could guide the students was important as well. I mean, I, I was particularly struck by the comments about lack of preparation for the teachers yeah. and that, you know, yeah, so as a lot of times in nursing, this is a good idea, okay, we'll kind of go Just for it 100%. It some people were not familiar enough with it mm. and and that led them presumably to be afraid and not to be sympathetic with yes. the idea. Yes, I was going to ask mm. about the preparation of mentors but mm. you've, you've addressed that there. Um, Lynn, thank you very much for your, for your question and um, we, ha we, we hope you've, we've addressed that for you but um, may I just come across to Faye now and ask you have some question? Christine, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, and a very positive comment about midwifery. I think for me, hearing the midwifery comment, it was a relief to note your observation about cohort size, because something that I know we're often told in midwifery mm -hmm. is that we get the results we do because of the numbers that we work mm -hmm. with. And my belief has always been is that it reflects the distinct culture of midwifery and how midwives work in practice. Yes, one of our team was a, an ITU specialist and she said she thought that that was parallel to midwifery that, and what was distinctive about it was it was very in your face, mm. your accountability for life yeah. and that that's what kind of added to the intrinsic motivation and commitment that the students and the midwives demonstrated. Thank you. I want to look at the work you've done um, and look at whether it has provided for us the empirical evidence for the continued wholesale use of portfolios. Because I think until you did that work, yes, mm -hmm. there was work in the literature, but it seemed mm -hmm. to be something that we embraced, everybody embraced mm -hmm. it, and we did all sorts. Do you think yes. we've got some sound empirical evidence from what you've seen? To support this practice? Well, the original introduction of portfolios, as you know, everybody had to use them, came from one of the earlier EMB projects that was done by the University of East Anglia team. And then they got a, a second project for the EMB where they um, evaluated the introduction and, and they pretty, pretty much turned around their own opinions and came to the point that it was direct observation that was essential to demonstrating competence. They were not um, nurses, they were education people right. and I think it's quite interesting that the, the influence that they had and then that they subsequently had to, to go back on it and the, this, so picking up again on that, the whole issue of, of is it a valid and reliable method mm -hmm. is what lay behind 
us doing it. I think in a way, like all of these long projects, once they're completed, they've already been overtaken mm -hmm. to a certain yeah. extent. Yeah. I was only yesterday at an exam board at um, another university, not, not for pre-reg in fact, but I couldn't help but notice what was going on about pre-reg. And in fact there, they were using OSCEs as a final assessment method for their pre-registration students. And it was obviously a huge thing because they had enormous numbers and it was taking mm. a uh, a matter of weeks to work through all the students but it was their final clinical exam I was told that they had to pass it and if they didn't they had a further period of training and they had to redo it so a, a lot of what we're doing seems to be going round cycles again mm. and revisiting things that we did in the past which we found not to be satisfactory classroom examinations for example when certainly when I was a student, moving on to other methods and, and moving on not because we've tested and found those to be better but just seemingly by trial and error and I, I was amazed by this OSCE thing because of the actually huge volume of work that would be involved in pre-reg and, and when I asked them about it they said they thought that that was the way lots of schools would now be going having got the practical classroom yeah. They're almost, well, let's use it. What I find, um, my students mm. use OSCEs, and what I find mm. is that, and they also have to develop a portfolio, and so I, I find it quite interesting to see how the two relate. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it is used as some form of, it does contribute to summative assessment, the OSCE aspect, and you can see that the sort of boost in portfolio development once they've completed the OSCE because they've gained in confidence mm -hmm. and they feel competence um, in respect mm -hmm. of clinical credibility. So it, it, for me, you can actually see a stage of, of learning taking, in, taking place, mm -hmm. which I yes. think is um, extremely yes. valuable mm -hmm. to them. It's giving them evidence. Mm -hmm. That's another aspect of thinking about research methods and how they relate to it because that kind of triangulation of evidence mm. from written mm. material mm. and a demonstration of that kind mm. and um, I mean you, I th I'm sure you know much more about it than I do Annie but it's a possible criticism of OSCE is that they're artificial mm. in, the, in the same way as it was of, of sure. classroom exams mm. and um, when I was at Manchester early on and the students did anatomy and physiology, the nursing degree students, with the medical students, their anatomy exam was an OSCE thing with stations mm -hmm. and they, the stations were specimens in glass jars, you know, and they yes. had to comment on what it, That seems to me a different kind of mm -hmm. thing from the situations that you set up mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So there is that criticism of a possible artificiality. Yes, I think, I mean, there? obviously it's... I have a bias, so I mean, mm. it's in the preparation yeah. and mm. exactly what are you using the OSCEs to assess? Mm. Um, that's, that's the valuable question to ask from my perspective. Mm. Um, but the bottom line has to be, uh, as I was trying to hint before, can the student be failed on their practice? Because we, we somehow haven't yet, not that I'm aware of, definitely got a way that we can objectively say this student is not going to make a good practitioner and they must go based on well, the again, clinical it's just assessment. Opinion. I just think that um, my experience to date is, is demonstrating not only to the student to but to the a wider healthcare professional group mm -hmm. that act as examiners and assessors um, of the level of the ability of that student mm -hmm. Inevitably, the examiners involved in the OSCE shouldn't necessarily have contributed to the teaching of that particular no. station, so there's no bias in that way. But um, w what it does do is add to the clinical credibility w uh, as two professionals, so especially yes. if they're developing roles such mm -hmm. as nurse practitioners or paramedic practitioners. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that um, mm -hmm. that does help quite yeah. a lot. Quite a lot going on mm -hmm. there. I was going to pick up on I just re remembered what you said in the previous exchange about confidence, because it seemed particularly with the pre-registration students that competence was defined by clinical staff as confidence. And if the student oh, yes. was confident. 
And there was an issue in there because the students had been told rightly, and I'm sure we tell our students as well, when you go into clinical uh, placements, if you're asked to do something and you don't feel that you've had the preparation and you're not confident to do it, then you must say so. You know, you mustn't. Mm -hmm. But when students said that in the clinical areas, that was interpreted as lack of competence. Yeah, so that's two and different so it things. Was, it yeah, was two different things. Difficult to, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. to um, I've, I've sort got out. Some line, yeah. lined up questions yes, here. So I'm just uh, from Plymouth. Um, yeah. There are nine people there, which is nice to know. Yeah. Um, it, <clears throat> first part of a question is: I think you answered with with Fay. Um, uh, so in summary they're saying is the question answer yes to portfolios are worth pursuing with some modifications or no should we forget it and um, that I mean I'll ask you that first but I think you've already addressed that in, in the earlier one yes I, th I think Nothing maybe add. we should think about introducing some other methods perhaps not using a portfolio a hundred percent as the assessment method but also trying to make the portfolios move more towards the cake mix yes, and less absolutely. towards the shopping trolley mm -hmm. or the toast rack. Okay, I'm just going to move you along. Yep. Um, the second part, um, you talked about the lack of linkage between classroom theory and service practice. Mm -hmm. Is this more a feature of the way the course was structured rather than anything to do with the portfolio? I think it's to do with how to be clear about this teachers particularly thought about theory and practice in a separate way mm. and although one of the rationales for a portfolio is that it is a vehicle to link theory and practice the 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 evidence that teachers thought about it in a separate way and i think this happens here as well on the very front of the portfolio it says practice portfolio mm. so you know, before you even open it, it's telling you this is to do with practice mm -hmm. and not to do with theory. As I said in the presentation, students were very unclear about whether they should bring references into the evidence mm -hmm. in the portfolio, mm -hmm. for example. I think the clinical staff didn't talk about that at all. They were much more focused on the actual skills and the, the confidence yes, it is element. The drawing together of all the packages. Yeah. So, that, so to down. sum that up, the intention of the portfolio <coughs> being a vehicle to link theory and practice wasn't fulfilled. Mm. No. Okay, now I've, Ray's asked a question. Hi Ray. Um, I'm sure he says, I'm sure it's my ignorance and lack of background but I did not understand the significance of the bit about good personal relationships in midwifery and its significance for portfolios. Could you say more about the significance of that comment for studying of portfolios? So he's asking, say more about the significance yes. of of the relationship, the the very positive comments you made between the midwifery yes. student and the midwife. Yes. What I was trying to say there was that the midwifery students, even the pre-registration students, the model of practice and using the portfolios was much closer to the specialist practice post-registration, in that students would have great, much greater continuity of assessor, that the assessor also was closely involved in the practice, that they would work together and the assessor would be directly observing what the student did. Mm. So th this phrase, knowing, you know, I, I know, mm. I, I couldn't not know, it couldn't be faked because there I am looking at it. Mm. Can I add yeah. a comment to that? Mm. Um, I think in midwifery, one, assessors or clinical staff are often involved in developing the portfolio and the language that's mm -hmm. used. But one of the things we're seeing just now mm -hmm. is to do with failure. This thing of knowing, mm -hmm. they do know, and yes. we are beginning to see failures emerging. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And it probably ties in with that. Mm -hmm. could, could I just ask yeah. a question? And it, probably taking back, going back to the point um, with regard to this idea of transforming the evidence that's actually yes. placed into the portfolio. So rather than gather a range of data that is mm -hmm. significant, of mm -hmm. course, but yes. then something happens to it in order mm -hmm. to demonstrate professional development yes. and academic standing, if you like. Mm -hmm. I think it's that bit that is that I've actually seen in some excellent portfolios mm -hmm. in the mentorship program where students have excelled, 
and mm -hmm. it is in a way I see that possibly as, a, as an opportunity where students don't do so well in exams or maybe in OSCEs mm -hmm. or assignments mm -hmm. in, a, in an essay format but actually can clearly articulate through their portfolio mm -hmm how mm. they have grown professionally. Yes. Yeah. I think that, that mm. is a critical bit. Um, in, yeah. and, and it actually yeah. takes into account, in my mind, the sort of range of uh, learning and teaching styles that we, we take on board. Yes, so that, that's the cake mix, isn't yes, it? They, the, mm. It yes. is actually mm. demonstrating yes. that uh, mm. it's, their thinking has changed and their yes. practice has developed rather than just recording a list yes. of, of things that they have done. Mm. Yeah, I was just wondering about sort of how much creativity should we encourage in the development of this portfolio? Because m myself, I just think if we're too structured or if if, if it is too limiting yes. the actual process mm. of developing reflection, then we mm. do lose that very valuable creativity aspect, which would link yes. with Lynn's aspect about learning styles. But also we've got to balance that as exactly. academics. Exactly, that's the word, I, balance was the word that mm. I was coming yeah. to my mind as you were talking. Mm. And that maybe as teachers and experienced nurses, we, we kind of almost think that reflection and is automatic, mm. whereas it, it isn't. It's something that we've acquired, mm. hopefully, mm. over the years, mm. and, and that you need to be helped to get into that and that that's where our suggestion of using very simple models to begin with mm -hmm. to, to give that yes. grounding and then give the person the greater flexibility mm -hmm. and openness for um, creativity as they go mm. through the program. I mean sometimes you yes. get students that are just stuck on you know the actual model itself yes. and you, you mm. have to say well look, just think of verbs mm. of what was good yes. and then begin to build mm. your picture. Yes when we started the the research, nobody was using portfolios to assess practice on master's programmes, but I think by now they will be doing mm -hmm. so. And at that stage, I would anticipate that a much more open sure, yeah. approach mm -hmm. would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. OK, I'll just come back to the laptop yeah. and another question. Um, thank you, Alex, um, for your input to the laptop here. How do we get around the problem of not being able to fail students on practice, I'm being asked? Yes. Students did leave the course as a result of practice. But it was done, as I think it always has been done over years, by counselling them out. Mm. You know? And if students had unsatisfactory uh, attitudes and behaviour in the placements, then they would, they were, that was dealt with more, either through counselling or an actual disciplinary mm. process. It wasn't the portfolio itself that was used to do that. So a small number of students did go, but it, it not directly using the portfolio as evidence to support that. Okay, I think we've got just a very quick time left, yes. a very brief yeah. last comment from somebody that says, yes, we need to encourage creativity and further study and research. Then the assessors would be less likely to comment that they are reading just the same words again and again mm. in the portfolio. Mm. So I think that was a contributing, mm. um, yes. contributing comment. May I say thank you very much for a very stimulating you. discussion and thank you yeah. both Ruth and Faye for your time. Okay. Um, I'd, I, again, I'd just like to um, end and say thank you to everybody, you, especially your involvement. Um, the next research seminar is going to be by the National um, Institute for Clinical Excellence and that's going to discuss the, the NICE guidelines on the use of asthma inhalers in older children. The seminar is on the 25th of September 2003 at 12 midday and so until that time may I wish you a very pleasant summer and goodbye from us all at the studio.
and welcome in the series of the Institute of Health Studies Research Seminar. Um, this month I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Professor Christine Webb, who is a Professor of Health Studies and works with us here at the Institute. Christine will be discussing the evaluation of the use of portfolios in the assessment of learning and competence in nursing, midwifery and health visiting. I feel this will be of great value as it will help to identify how we can further contribute towards a student's investment in their portfolio development. This will also help us to judge the merit of their collection of evidence and the contribution this makes towards their practice development. Also joining us today is Faye Doris, Head of Department Maternal Child Health and Podiatry and Ruth Clemo, Senior Lecturer in Adult Nursing. They will assist us in further inquiry of Christine's presentation while we wait for a telephone call. The telephone number is 01752 233 646 or you can email the studio on tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk. Today's programme will follow its usual format. I'll shortly hand over to Christine and following her presentation we will be keen to receive your calls. This should be about between 12.30 and 1 o'clock. Can I remind you at this point that you do need to utilise the mute button on your handset as you speak. This will avoid the feedback noise sometimes experienced. Do call. We do value your participation. Now without further delay, I'm going to hand over to Christine. Do enjoy evaluation of the use of portfolios in the assessment of learning competence in nursing, midwifery and health visiting. Thank you, Annie. Um, I first of all need to apologise if I'm going to be uh, peering a lot. I have a problem with my glasses and the light and everything, so take no notice of the funny uh, facial gestures that you might see. Um, I'm going to first of all flash through some of the issues in the literature and then say very briefly about the uh, methods that we used in the study because I know what people are mostly interested in these occasions is the findings. So we found discussions in the literature about the authenticity of what people were writing in their portfolios and how this was verified. In other words, was what they were writing a valid reflection of the experience they were having in their practice and was the assessment reliable you know if if they had been assessed on the same evidence by different assessors would they have uh, had the same assessment outcome and how useful in assessment was critical reflectiveness development and how did that link up with practice and what was the role of academic staff in facilitation and guidance? Tublio really tells the person who looks at it about your competence. And so a Project 2000 student said, it's the generic statements. Another one said, I'm not sure. Some of the statements are more relevant than others. The skills log is more relevant. Another one said, I really don't know. I struggle with the portfolio because I've been out of school for 23 years. I have the problem that in every placement I go to, I have the problem of identifying what I've done with what they say in the portfolio. So that last one is really a very good summary of what I'm saying about deconstruction and reconstruction. And when we put the same question to an assessor on a pre-reg program, she said, I don't think you can identify one particular section. The pathway specific tasks, and it's interesting she uses the word tasks, is vital. That, that was really um, the, what the students called the skills log. All nurses need specific skills, she went on, especially to start off with and to build upon. Also, the competency that she meant there, the generic outcomes, reflects a deeper understanding. Right. So when you look at the literature, what is identified as crucial to evidence in portfolios is not just documenting what's been done, but actually using that material. In other words, reflections, external examiners' reports, etc. And then the third stage was intended to be observation in the clinical areas to see how the portfolios were being used. But in practice, it turned out not to be feasible. And the third stage really became interviews in the clinical uh, setting with students and their assessors. So mostly paired interviews. 
Right. We concluded that what was happening when students were using the portfolios was that they were having to deconstruct the learning outcomes. Now, they had to look at the learning outcomes that were set out in the portfolios and ask themselves, what do they mean? And they found that there was a lot of overlap and repetition between these outcomes. Many of the um, portfolios were using as outcomes the statements of the 89 um, Nurses Act or the UKCC generic outcomes. And students and assessors found those written at such a globally abstract level that they really couldn't tell what they meant. And so what they had to do was kind of unpick them and, and see how does this really link with our practice and then kind of reconstruct what they were doing in practice to write it in their portfolios to give what they thought that the teachers expected. So I'll give you um, a few quotes um, that the, are the evidence for that assertion. We asked the students, which part of your portfolio towards preparation of the portfolio? And another issue, which I'm sure people have also come across in the literature, is, is there a conflict between the summative assessment function and the learning value? No, does the assessment really become the tail that wags the dog and detract from the actual learning that might otherwise potentially take place? So first of all, uh, before I go on to how students actually use the portfolios, just very uh, two or three sentences about the design. It was a two-year EMB-funded study um, that was conducted across four universities, the lead one being Plymouth. And first of all, um, Kim Pankhurst joined us and did a national telephone survey. The purpose of that was meant to be to identify models of portfolio that we would then pursue in subsequent stages in four case studies. But what we found was really there was no perceptible patterns across the board. No people in different in one institution could be using different models of portfolio in their different programs. So we chose our four case studies on the basis of variation, really maximum variation. Although, as I'll come to in a minute, we did identify some models as we went along. So the second stage was to go into the university side of those four case studies and do interviews with the teaching staff. Um, we did observation in classrooms. We did some um, focus groups with students. We looked at the curriculum documents, the QAA evaluation.